camera. Um, sorry for all of the for the mess. Uh, the, I'm not very sure, but my PC seems to be dead. And um, also, I'm, I'm using the PC of the university instead, so there might be some. Um, I need to switch between the slides and the animation sometimes, uh, but I hope it's okay for you. Okay, so my name is Taku Komara. I'm uh, working in the University of Edinburgh. I'm a researcher. Um, I'm a reader of position for I'm working as a as an associate professor in, in Edinburgh University. And today I talk about this uh, topic about learning human movements by the Compositional Neural Network. <coughs> oh, so this is only for the PowerPoint, I think. So, okay, so let's just go through the slides. So this is the outline. So I first talk about the motivation and then about some deep learning things. And then about uh, some, um, and I will show some animation and then talk about the evaluation. So I think my topic is very different from what the other people are working on in this uh, room. So um, my research topic is about basically generating animation for computer animation movies companies. Okay. And so uh, actually, so we this project was done together with this company called Marza Animation Planet. So they are a sub company of Sega, Sega animation, uh, Sega computer game company Sega, and they produce these movies called this. Um, Space Pirate uh, Captain Harlock. So this is like a um, a very old Japanese animation, and they converted it into a 3D animation movie. They also were planning to produce this animation um, about the dogs. Um, so uh, which were why we were working together. So when creating this kind of uh, animation, it's very time consuming and many money costing. So what we people do is like they do use a method called keyframe animation. So this is like, say you want to generate this kind of a nice looking jumping motion, what you usually do is that you just, instead of present, preparing all the frames of this motion, what you do is basically you prepare three frames. Okay? So this is like a representative frames of this jumping motion. And then the system is going to not just do some interpolation between these frames and then construct this natural looking jumping motion. So this is something that the animators do. But the animators, so if it's, we want to have like a movie of like two or hours or three hours, it's very time consuming. So they have to like produce tons of thousands of keyframes. And they actually, this company, they hire like hundreds of animators for doing this task. So this is a very um, money costing business. And so uh, so the, the reason that they want to had a, we had a chance to collaborate is to make use of motion capture data. So motion capture data is uh, motion capture is a system to capture the real human motion. So you put a lot of markers on the human body, and then you put a lot of cameras inside the room. You move around, and all your motion is going to be digitized. So this is very uh, useful. And nowadays, this, these devices are not very expensive anymore. So you can act, we can actually capture the real human motion and apply them to the characters in the movie. So this is uh, one of our motivation. And secondly, actually, they, we have applications like robotics or computer games as well. So when we are, want to control these kind of robots or humans, actually their degrees of freedom is very high. So usually they have like 30 or 40 joints. And all these joints have to be controlled simultaneously to conduct this kind of motion, like climbing over the stairs or climbing over this kind of a um, but uneven terrain. So when controlling these robots, still we want to use something like a gate pad. So this is very low dimensional signal. So it's just like specifying the direction that these robots or the humans are moving. Maybe you press the button to jump or do something, some specific action, but it's very low dimensional. So the problem is that we want to control this kind of high, di high dimensional system using low dimensional signals. So this is something that is of the interest of, of these robotics and character animation. Okay. And so uh, so we, um, what we did, uh, sorry, here was supposed to be an animation, but because of this trouble, I cannot show it now. I will later on show. So uh, we prepared some system that the animators can just draw a line or curve over the terrain. And then the character follows this terrain, these lines over the terrain, running or walking. Okay, so this is like a very simple system because the animator only needs to provide this kind of a 2D signal 
and then the full body animation is generated. So, um, oh, there are tons of previous work for this, so I work from in this community of computer graphics. They have lots of, um, there are lots of researchers working on these kind of things, and there are lots of people use this kind of motion capture system and then produce something, some nice data structure for this motion graph. This is a compact graph where the where you traverse over the graph and then you are switching between different poses of this character and it automatically generates the motion in between. So this is uh, some research that has been going on for 10 years, but actually it's a, they say like you just give the motion and it generates this nice data structure for you which generates the animation, but actually there's lots of manual process in between. So things like you have to do like segmentation, so if it's like a walking cycle, you have to cut at the beginning of the walking and the end of the walking. Maybe you also need to classify all these motions like into punching or dancing or ducking or jumping kind of, you have to do the labeling. And finally, you have to align all these motions, so if it's a walking motion, you have to all align all the motions so that the walking starts from the right foot and ends at the left foot. So a lot of manual processing, and this again, Actually, it doesn't, so this is going to take time of the developer instead. And uh, so these are quite a, a big issue. And also like when we are doing, when we want to control robots, most of the robots nowadays, they also, when they we want them to climb over the stairs or like do things like grasping a bag and put, hook it, put it on a hook or something, they do a lot of template matching kind of things. So what they do is that they have a very simple example motion or example idea of what they should do and they are going to like we, they, they recognize the scene and they when they see a hook okay they find that there's a hook and then they are going to do this motion of putting the hook over the bag under on the hook okay so uh, when they see a different hook they have to do the template matching they must look into the dictionary they have and find all kinds of hooks that match well and then find it and then they just do this one so this is again not very, very smart in the sense that you have to prepare lots and lots of examples inside the database and find the one that is appropriate and then just try to mimic this. So these are also not very uh, well, well uh, this is a traditional way of doing this. So we wish to uh, what change this pipeline. Okay, so then now we go into this deep learning. So deep learning is a very hot topic nowadays. Uh, and so it has been um, used a lot for um, image recognition and synthesis, and it's uh, the, it's also starting to be used for computer graphics research as well. And the thing is that uh, the good thing is that we can learn from a huge amount of data, and this is something that is was difficult by previous researches. Okay, so here are some example research that is of using deep learning in the computer graphics society. And so this one is like a research, this is a proposed by um, the students in Waseda University. So it's like adding, automatically adding the colors to the grayscale images. So this is very nice. So you can apply this to very old movies and then you can colorize it. So this, you can like make it a bit more modern. Okay, so the way they do it, this is, they use a method called supervised learning. So actually, it's very easy to prepare this kind of pairs of grayscale images and colored images, you know. And so what the system, what the deep network tries to do is that they try to find a matching, they try to find out what color they should attach to each of these pixels of the grayscale image. In this case, actually, you know the answer because you have the pair of the grayscale image and the colored image. So what they try to do is that they try to train this neural network so that it adds the color that matches to the correct color. Okay, so you try to minimize this, uh, this cost function, which is the color between the real color and the one that is generated by the neural network. By giving like millions of images like this one, the neural network can find out what color should be added to you know, scenes like the sky or like the, the, the water on the ground, or maybe the hair or the skin or the dogs, all these kind of things they can learn what kind of color should be added. And another um, popular topic is like this kind of face generation. So you, there are lots of millions of face images on the web. So we can download these kind of images and dump this into the neural network. Yeah? And then the system is going to automatically learn all the axes that are important for generating these faces. 
So these axes can be something like um, like the hair color, or maybe the, the height of the nose, or maybe the distance between the eyes, or all these kinds of things. So actually, these kind of parameters are just automatically learned. You don't need to really specify them by yourself. So th this is an unsupervised learning scheme. So because you're not really providing any kind of information what, of what the face should be like, you just provide all these images, and it automatically learns all these axes that uh, features the face. Okay, so. Uh, just come back to this merits of the deep learning. So, uh, as I said before, it can learn from a big data, so we can learn from millions of images or millions of uh, motion data. So this is good, and also it does the automatic feature extraction. So you don't need to like say, okay, here we want uh, these, the face is something that is composed of eyes and nose and mouth, and then the you know distance between them should be like this and that. You don't have to do anything like that. You just dump all these images to the system. And it's also like parallel friendly. You can use the GPU very efficiently. And you can handle nonlinearity and high compression rate, um, very fast data construction. Actually, some of the talk, um, the results today is about those. Um, so now let's go a bit more into what I do. So we use these kind of supervised and unsupervised learning. So we first do something for this um, use this convolutional autoencoder. So this is an unsupervised learning approach. So we just give a lot of motion capture data to the system, and it automatically learns what the motion is like. And secondly, we do this uh, convolutional feed-forward network. So like, like I was describing below before, so we want to let the animators draw some line over the ground, and then let the character follow this and generate natural motion. So this is like actually a regression problem. So it's like producing a regression function between the line over the ground and how the full body motion, how, how the full body should move. Okay. And so uh, those are the main things that we do. Okay. And so now let's, let me talk a little bit about this autoencoder thing. So uh, the human body space is actually not very small, actually it's relatively large. So we, assuming that we have a character, so the human body it has about like 20 joints. Okay. So we have 20 joints and each of them they, we can represent it by the 3D coordinates in the Euclidean space. So after all, it's going to be like a 60-dimensional data okay, that's for one frame, and that goes over time, so it's going to be, the size is going to be larger, but we use this representation of 60 degrees of freedom. But actually, all the poses of this 60 degrees of freedom are just not in the full 60 degrees of freedom space, but there's, all, uh, there's something called a subspace which is a low dimensional space where all the ex natural human motion exists. Okay? So because like, uh, there can be like, very strange motions like your, you know, your neck being bent too much or like, your arms bending backwards too much, these kind of motions are not natural, so they are not going to be in this motion manifold, okay? this subspace. So uh, we actually want to, it's very good to know this kind of motion manifold, so then we can do a lot of things and recognize human motion. Okay. So for example, uh, we can do something like this projection. So if we have a very odd motion, so say we have a very corrupted data that is like due to the sensor noise or whatsoever, we can project it onto this motion manifold and convert it nicely to the natural looking human motion. Or we can also like do something like interpolation. So we have, assuming we have two different poses, we can naturally interpolate these poses on this motion manifold, then the in-between poses are also going to be natural looking at human motion. So also we can actually calculate the distances between different motions. So if we we are have two different motions, we calculate the distance over in the 3D, uh, in, in the Euclidean space, actually it's not going to be very accurate, but if we calculate the distance over this manifold, it's going to be more accurate. Yeah. And so, uh, those are what we can do. I'm sorry. So, where are we? Okay. So, this, uh, for this purpose, okay, for cal calculating this uh, natural subspace of human motion, we are using this technique called this autoencoder. So, autoencoder is a method to convert the representation of this original motion into this subspace representation. Okay. And so the method goes like this. Yeah? So assuming that we have this 
corrupted. So what we do is that we give the motion as the original motion. We're going to add a lot of noise to the motion, so it's like moving some, some joints to some random location or changing the values to zero. And then we're going to pass it through this um, autoencoder. So it's converted into the hidden units and then converted back to the original motion. Okay? And then when it's converted back to the original motion, what we try to do is that we try to make the difference of the reconstructed motion. This is x. Uh, uh, this is the this is the reconstructed motion that is passed through the autoencoder. We want to make the difference of the reconstructed motion and the original correct motion as small as possible. So we try to optimize the neural network so that all these noises are removed. Okay? And by repeating this process for lots of lots of motion, we can generate this kind of a motion manifold that corrects all the motion and which is actually consisting of all the natural looking motions. Okay? And so, uh, so that's the one, one thing we do. And then we do something called this convolutional neural network. So this is, uh, again, used a lot for image recognition. And so the point of this method is that it learns some kind of a filter that is naturally representing all kinds of motions. So the, the filter, the convolutional filter, is just a small size of image. We are going to slide this all over the image okay, and try to make use. So we are going to do the convolution of this small convolutional filter and images, and then uh, we're going to, that's going to produce something called this feature map, okay? and then we are going to make another filter that slides over the feature map, and then generate the feature map of the feature map, okay? and then we keep on doing this for multiple layers, okay? and then actually all these filters are going to learn what images are like. Okay? So, Actually, after you do this process for many, many layers and many, many images, at the bottom layers, these convolution filters become filters like these. Okay? So these are something called, these look like something called the Gaber filter, which are useful when detecting the lines, okay, the direction of the lines. Okay, so they are very fundamental features. And actually, in the middle layers, if you train the network with something like the eyes, then this kind of eye shape is going to be naturally composed. And at the highest layer is going to be something like the human face. So these kind of filters are naturally generated just from the example images. Okay? And if we train the network with the, something like cars, it's going to naturally learn, learn the components of the cars, and then the car shapes, and it might be animals, it's going to learn all these kind of hierarchical, hierarchical structures. Okay? So this is very interesting because uh, we're not really <coughs> telling the computer anything, we're just giving all these images and it naturally finds out all these features. So uh, we apply the same idea to, to human motion. So what we do here is that we give all these motions. So the filters in our case is going to represent a short duration of motion. Okay? And so we're going to do the convolution between the, the motion and the filters. Okay? And if the similarity of the filter and the motion is same, the values of the hidden units are going to be higher. If they are very different, the value is going to be smaller. Okay. By doing this, so what we are going to do, as I mentioned before, autoencoder is that we give the motion, we are going to encode and decode again. And we try to make the decoded motion as similar as possible to the original motion. Okay. And so by doing this for many, many motions, we are going to be able to learn all these filters that are going to represent all the motions. Yeah? So these are very useful because we can generate all kinds of motions by combining all these smaller number of filters. So that's something like, this is like learning the, how the motions are composed. Okay. And now maybe I can show a little bit of this movie that I was preparing. So basically what we can do is that we, using these filters, we can do some 
denoising of the motion. So even though there are noises, we can calculate the you know we remove the noise. We can also like calculate the similarity of the motion. So we can give an example motion and compute all the similar motions from the database. Okay. And so uh, that's uh, what we can do. So now uh, let me quickly go through this uh, regression part. So uh, so after doing that part, uh, so now I'm talking about this uh, what. Con constructing the full body motion from a low dimensional signal. So we can, in this case, what we're doing is that we draw the line over the ground and try to reproduce the full body motion of this character. So this is um, something that is useful for the animators. And so we generate this neural network for doing this purpose. And so when doing this motion, so we, at the end, again, we have this motion manifold so that, you know, all the motions are represented in the hidden the, the hidden unit space of this motion, and uh, so there is a subspace of the motion. We just can generate the motion over this subspace. Okay. And so let's take a look at this movie now. Okay, so this is like the so this is the line over the ground, and the character motion is generated. So the animator in this case only needs to draw this line over the ground. So the point, actually the, the density represents the speed of this character. So if you have a sparse point, it's going to move faster. specifying the position of the hands and producing the full body motion because we have the information about the subspace of the motion by just giving these constraints we can generate a natural full body motion. So this is something like editing the motion in the, in the subspace of the mo motion manifold. So using all this uh, running motion we can just edit the motion grab things or like go over these There's squares. Okay, well let me just play this part as well. So we can also do some um, interesting editing of these <laughs> motions. So we can provide something called the style motion, which is like a different style of motion like walking in a zombie style. You can apply this zombie style to ordinary walking motion and convert it into this zombie walking motion. motion stuff and then we can apply it to this green character and convert it to this um, what, old walking motion. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much for this movie. so that it walks over this kind of an uneven terrain. So here, it's like we are also taking into account the sh geometry of the ground So in order to control this character. So here you can see that this line is drawn over the ground. So this is generated by the, by, by the gamepad controller. And then the character takes this the shape of this geometry and then conduct the motion that is appropriate. So of course you can maybe see this kind of motion in the computer games. 
But again, in the computer games, they are just doing it by this template matching kind of things. So you already have the motion appropriate, and you are labeling them that they should do what kind of motion at which situation. But here, it's a fully learned based, it's a training based approach. So we just provide a lot of information, examples of this character walking over different shapes of the ground. And then it automatically learns what should be done at which situation. Okay. And uh, so, so okay. So for for the evaluation, actually, so this uh, um, what, this neural network is quite good. So we can learn from from a large number of data. Okay, so uh, like previous methods, actually, they cannot learn from large amount of data. But uh, in our case, we can learn from like 24 hours of motion capture data. Well, this is quite uh, big in terms of the computer in the human motion sense. And uh, so we download all these kind of different motions from the from the world, and also we do the motion capture ourselves a lot. And so this kind of 1.5 gigabyte of motion capture data, actually, after training the neural network, it, we can shrink it to 8 megabytes. You know, so this is very nice. So it's like reducing the size 200 times. So and actually, from this 8 megabytes of neural network, we can produce all the motions that are existing in the motion capture database. So this is quite efficient. And also, um, it's very fast to generate all these motions. So we can actually generate every frame of this kind of walking motion in nanoseconds on the CPU. If it's on the GPU, it can be even faster. And so, for example, um, what I wanted to show uh, at the end is this. Is this uh, no, not this one. So, so maybe just uh, a quick show. this kind of crowd animation. So lots of characters walking simultaneously. Actually, um, this neural network is very GPU friendly. So we can actually generate all these characters motion for all the frames simultaneously. So that motion, uh, that, that animation is like 10 seconds of crowd animation, but we can generate this entire motion in just two seconds. Okay. And so, uh, <coughs> so, so, so now, uh, almost the end. And so uh, we are collaborating with uh, uh, Kitamura, uh, Professor Kitamura's lab. And so we are, uh, because we are interested in this motion of like grasping and manipulating objects, they have, as they, there is a motion capture system here which can capture all these kind of fine movements of the fingers. These are very useful when we want to generate motions like opening a, a cup of it or something, or like maybe like using some tools. These kind of motions are very difficult to capture by existing motion capture systems. So this is very good. So we can capture loads of motion of the fingers, and then uh, train the neural network based on this. And then we can use this for like maybe like controlling the robots to do some similar manipulations. So this is something that is going to happen pretty soon. And um, I'm sure this is going to be a good research direction um, for the for Japan as well as for for the UK. And so um, this is uh, well, hopefully we can some good work here. And so, yeah, so in summary, um, so the, these kind of neural networks, they are very useful for the human motion capture data. So it can like um, learn from a lot of data. And we are also introduced, it's not like we are just using existing systems and like just applying to, to the human motion. We are actually proposing new novel ar architectures of neural networks so that we can ha handle these constraints, these real-time constraints or the size of the neural network should be smaller. We propose different methods for this. And we can, uh, what at the same time, we can import lots of new ideas in the machine learning community. So if you know, there are like thousands of papers written uh, every month, I think, and uploaded to some archive. So nowadays, people can't wait for publishing in the conferences. They just upload to the archive, and then they, they, they present to the world. So we have to keep updating what's going on. And so, uh, yeah, so on the other hand, computer graphics is very good for, for this kind of, as a target of applying machine learning. So machine learning basically may, may have been used a lot for natural language processing and also like speech recognition and image recognition. But computer graphics is another uh, interesting application. So I think it's very beneficial for both communities. 
And so, um, yeah, so that's pretty much all for my talk. And uh, sorry for all the confusion and, and the mess, um, um, but I uh, hope you could understand what we are doing now. Okay, thank you very much.